So what we're, what we're doing here is, notice of course you could rearrange this. We could, we could rearrange this to say V of X and T is equal to U of X and T minus U equilibrium of X, right? Everybody agree with that? And so, you should be able, you should see what happens. What's the partial of v with respect to t? Partial of v with respect to t. When you take the partial with respect to t over here, what do you get? Partial Just partial u with respect to t. And if you take two partials with respect to x, you're going to get um, v x x, u x x, and u e double prime. But the equilibrium said that u double prime was equal to zero. zero. That's what the equilibrium was. And so then you can clearly see that v satisfies the same equation as u. Okay? So that's the first part. It shows the PDE. Put in the boundary conditions. You just look at what is v of zero and t. Well, what was u of zero and t? A, what was the equilibrium at zero? A, it had to satisfy A also, right? You wanted those to satisfy the same boundary conditions. So this was A, this was A, you subtract them and you get homogeneous. You can do the same thing with the other boundary. And now, what are you going to get for the initial condition? Well, the initial condition is just going to be v of x of 0. It's going to be u of x and 0. You know what it is, right? And you've already solved for this, right? You know what u e of x is, so you just put u e of x in there. Right? So that's all it is. It's just plug and chug. Okay. Next question. Yes. I was just curious if you know when our first exam is going to be. No, don't know. I could look up in the past and make an estimate. That's okay. But you could also do, you could go back to uh, uh, the spring of 20, I think. The trouble with spring of 20 is 20 was an odd year. I was just ready to give the exam and what hit? <laughs> go. <laughs> and suddenly I had to redesign everything. Um, you go to spring of 19 is probably a good guess as to approximate stuff. Because I haven't, I haven't changed this course dramatically, um, but I'm doing little minor things differently. Uh, I choose exams based on subject matter. I'll try to look, I can, you can send me an email and I can look at what's, where I usually like to make the split. As, as I said, it's, it's subject matter based, based uh, exams. Yes, question. Um, so I had a question on 2.3.8 for the textbook one. Uh, so on that one, on part A, I keep getting the trivial solution. Um, and I just want to make sure that this goes there. So part A for the possible equilibrium, uh, your instinct is pretty good. It's at zero at each end and you're losing heat in the bar. 
where can it go? Not too many places you can go until we get some research. Yeah. Oh, so another question. For this homework, are we also supposed to do 1.5.21? That's the one above. You don't do 1.5.21. You're only doing, okay. you're using 1.5.21 in order to do 1.5.22. Oh, okay. So you need this formula. These are normalization factors for the change of coordinates, which you will have done in Calc 3. And you're trying, what you want to do is we want to look at. This is, the, this is general for any type of coordinate system you would have. But we want to specifically look at, because we're going to work with this, what happens with cylindrical coordinates? What happens with spherical coordinates? Okay? I think there was a 1.5.23 that I didn't assign, which was spherical coordinates. These should all sort of relate a lot to what you did in Calc 3. This just gives a more formalization. So, yeah, all you have to do is really you, uh, you set, the, set these uh, partial derivatives up for your different coordinates, find the normalizing factor that's going to be h, and then you'll get the, the natural ones. And this one's going to relate very closely to uh, ones like this, which can, comes up in uh, this particular one, if you notice, is really the one you have the last problem of the uh, of the uh, lecture activity, right? Because we need, we're going to want to see what happens when we change from coordinates. We don't want to just work on lines and rectangles. We work on other things. And so we need to know what those operators are like. And that's what we do. So, no, you don't have to do this, but you do have to do that. Is that, yeah. did you do this? Uh, not yet. Not yet. It's not terrible. Okay. Other questions. Probably the hardest thing is the um, is the lecture activity two problem number two because you have to do the all those partial derivatives and know that, for example, when you're taking when you take the partial of u with respect to r, that's going to be the partial of u with respect to x, partial of x with respect to r, and this is easily found because of the definition, plus the partial of u with respect to y, partial of y with respect to r. Okay, this one of course is just cosine of theta, and this is sine of theta. So then when you take the next partial, you're going to have to do the same partials of these. So you're going to have the cosine partial of u with respect to x with respect to x and x with respect to r and y with respect to r and so forth. And so it gets pretty long. Um, that's a pretty long problem. And especially when you take two partials with respect to theta because you've got this in here and once you have to do the Even my solution is almost two, two pages. It's not a lot of money I take. <laughs> okay. Other questions on these things? Any questions? Hopefully they're fairly straightforward. These should be reminding you a lot of when you were doing your Calc 3 course, right? A lot of this stuff is related to the Calc 3 course and a few things. <clears throat> no other questions at this point. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to go back to where we left off. So we did the heat equation, and we did the heat equation with the Dirichlet boundary conditions, and we did the heat equation, which gave rise to the sine functions, remember? We got the sine functions for the Dirichlet boundary conditions. When we had the Neumann boundary conditions, 
we then came up with the cosine functions. And the important difference between that is you did get the constant function one was an eigenfunction. We then looked at the ring where we had the periodic boundary conditions. And under that circumstance, again, we get lambda equals zero gives rise to the function one, constant function as a uh, possible one. But you, but you also then got both the sine and the cosine as possible solutions. Okay? So those are, and that's going to be what's the uh, complete Fourier series. And we're, we'll soon be getting into Fourier series. Right now we still want to work with different, um, different operators. Okay. Again, these partial differential equations, the taking those partial derivatives are just operators, they are linear operators because differentiation is a linear process, right? Okay. And one of the things you should know by now in math is don't do too much nonlinear stuff. You try to do everything linear because you can. So once you start getting nonlinear, they all become special cases. If you remember in ODE, okay, you did the different nonlinear problems, they were all kind of a separate case. There's not a, a general theory for the nonlinear part. And what you would do if you have a nonlinear, you would if you get to the if you get to some of the more advanced ODE courses, then what do you do? You first linearize and you look at the nonlinearity as a perturbation of the linear linear problem. Okay. All right. So now what we want to do is we want to move beyond the heat equation to the process equation. Okay. Now the process equation is steady state temperature, and we're going to begin with a nice rectangle. Okay. So the process equation, we're looking at the state. So here's the situation. The general situation is we would have information about the temperature on all four boundaries, and we'd have an F1, G1, F2, G2 on the boundaries. And then we'd like to know what is that steady state temperature inside there. And the steady state temperature is the Laplacian equaling zero. And the Laplacian in the rectangular coordinates is the second partial u with respect to x squared plus the second partial u with respect to y squared. And again, the Laplace equation equals zero. Now, then, as I say here, you have to have specified boundary conditions. Now, if you just have general specified boundary conditions on there, it's going to be kind of hard to solve because remember, we've already talked about the idea we need to find our Stern Louisville problem. And the Stern Louisville problem always had homogeneous boundaries. That's how we got our eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. If it was non-zero, then we would generally have a situation where there's no solution. So how are we going to solve this particular problem? Well, here comes back to the idea that this is a linear operator. Everybody agrees that's a linear operator operator. Two partials with respect to x plus two partials with respect to y. You could easily see the linearity of that. You have a u1 and u2, you could add them up. So the easiest way to do this is then to reduce it to taking one boundary at a time. Say, let's let this one be an arbitrary f1 of x and make zeros on all the other boundaries. So we'll solve that problem. Then we'll solve the problem with u being this g1 and 0 on the rest of them, and then so forth, four separate problems. And then by linearity, we would get the solution by just adding those four solutions together, right? Because if we add a 0 to the f1, we still just get the f1, right? So that's the idea, is reduce this problem to an easier problem with just homogeneous boundary conditions. And so, oops. Down there, it looks better. 
Okay, so here's the problem. We're gonna now make, we're now gonna have our U1 Laplacian first solution. And we're gonna have it be zero on this vertical edge, on this vertical edge, and on this horizontal edge, keep it at an arbitrary F1 of X along the one. Okay. As I said, we would then still have three more problems to do. Problems for now are saying that they're pretty much the same. Okay, so again, the boundary conditions we want are three homogeneous boundary conditions and the one being F1 of X. Now the important thing on this is we have to have, we have to have pairwise homogeneous ones, which we can see this vertical one and this vertical one are pairwise homogeneous, right? And specifically, those are prescribed, so that is, what kind? What are prescribed boundary conditions? Called, it ends with a D. Dirichlet. Okay, so we're going to have nice homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions here. And before, when we had homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions, what functions did we get? Override functions. What eigenfunctions do we get? The heat equation. The eigenfunctions. With zero boundary conditions. Fixed boundary conditions. Right. The sine functions, right? The insulated gave us cosine functions. But if there are zero boundary conditions, they're sine. So we're already predicting this should have sort of sine functions going in x. And then we were able to get Fourier coefficients, right, for those particular ones. Okay, so that's the idea behind this particular one. So, let's see. Yeah, maybe I'll we'll separate it. Okay. So here is plus this equation on a rectangle with these conditions. Okay, we want to do separation of variables. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna take away the sum one. Just, you'll just understand that there's a sum one on everything here. And so what I want to do is I want to let, it's no longer a u of x and t, it's a u of x and y being there. Now, if we want separation of variables, we want to have it be some e equal to some, say, phi of x and some psi of y. Tradition just needs all these Greek letters. <clears throat> all right. So now let's substitute that into the partial differential equation. So if I take two partials with respect to x and my u is equal to this, what do I get? So I'm going to get a phi double prime of x psi, it's constant, with respect to x. And then we're going to get plus phi, and what about psi? And that equals zero, right? And I hope you can see it's not too hard to see that this would be equivalent to phi double prime over phi is equal to, notice we have a change in sign, so we're gonna have a minus psi double prime over psi. This is only a function of x, right? This is only a function of y, so it has to be what? It has to be a constant. And so we're gonna go ahead and choose a minus lambda. We're choosing minus lambda, we're choosing minus lambda, because we're already suspecting that it's going to have our Stern Louisville problem in X. Okay, now, so we have two ODEs, 
One of them is V double prime plus lambda phi is equal to zero. And the other one is psi double prime uh, plus uh, minus lambda psi is equal to zero. Now from the boundary conditions, the boundary conditions give us what? Let's forget the first one. The second one tells us what about psi of h? You better have that psi of h is equal to zero. Now, what is the first, what is that one, uh, the lower left-hand one? That tells us P of zero is what? Zero. And then we also have that P at L is also zero, right? So this tells us right away that our Stern-Louisville problem is going to be the phi double prime plus lambda phi equals zero. Phi at zero is equal to phi at L is equal to zero. OK, everybody agrees with that? That's, that comes up from our separation of variables. Now, have we seen this problem before? Yes, we did. It's exactly the same one with the heat the one-dimensional heat equation in the bar with the two endpoints being zero, right? And what was the result from that? We don't go through all the different cases and so forth. What did we find? Lambda is greater than zero. Lambda is greater than zero. And that with lambda equaling some alpha squared greater than zero gives Eigenvalues lambda n is going to be n squared pi squared over L squared. And we have eigenfunctions are going to be phi n of x, as we said, the sine function, right? It's going to give rise to sine of n pi x over l. Okay. Okay. Any questions on that? Again, we've already worked it. So if you were to go through the full details of this from scratch, we would have to look at lambda equals zero. That only gives the trivial solution. Lambda less than zero. That gives us a cautious and cinches. Again, equals zero. All right, so now what problem are we solving? Now, the psi one, the psi equation only has one homogeneous boundary condition. Okay? And so if we look at combining these two together, then it suggests, okay, we'll say the psi ODE is going to be psi double prime minus n squared pi squared over L squared psi because it's, it's the same integral it's the same constant right and in the separation of variables the constant that I have with the phi goes with the psi so we're going to get the psi n's associated with this I've got Let's go ahead and emphasize that this is my psi n. All right, so let's look at psi n, and it is a function of y. Okay. All right. Now, what would be a good choice as far as solutions of that particular differential equation? Everybody agrees that that constant n squared pi squared over L squared is a positive constant, right? 
So that's going to give rise to exponential form solutions. Now what would be good choices so that we can easily get some constants based on this particular information? This is a little tricky. I want to do a C1. Let me go ahead and tell you, of course, if it's negative, we're going to probably want to do cautious and cinches, right? Mm -hmm. So let's put a cosh function here. And we know it's going to have an n pi over L for its argument. I'll put some parentheses here. And we're going to put a C2 cinch n pi over L, put some brackets there like that. Okay, now how am I going to be able to get rid of one of those constants easily? This is where it gets a little bit of, this is where the math becomes a little Forcing the function. Clearly, if we put exponentials down there, we get some pretty messy constants, right? It would not be a lot of fun to do that. All right. Well, we'd, we'd like to center our argument about h, wouldn't we? So, how about h minus y? Does that help you? Because we're, we're, the homogeneous one is there at h. So, let's center it about that the way you center things. Middle school, where you shifted coordinates by a horizontal transfer, right? And so we're going to do an h minus y here. And we'll put an h minus y here. So then when y equals h, when y equals h, so psi n of h. First of all is equal to zero, but when I put y equal h in there, this of course is zero, isn't it? But this one is, that's going to be one. Cosh of zero is one, right? And so we're going to get zero is equal to c1. The c2 is going to be arbitrary. So putting that information together, we can now get our product solution un of x and y. So our, that's part of the reason I didn't want the 1 in there because I don't want to have all sorts of subscripts in there. So I'm going to have my un of x and y is going to be equal to some constant. Let's just go ahead and call and we know it's got a sign of n pi x over L. And then what's left over from there is the cinch function, right? It gives us the cinch of n pi over L times the argument h minus y. Again, you, you could choose other ones, but this is going to be the easiest one. Everybody agree with that? Okay. What is the only thing missing at this point? The coefficients. We don't know the coefficients of Vn. What we first have to do is we have to do the generalized superposition principle. We're going to have our general u of x and y is going to be equal to the sum n equals 1 to infinity. By the way, you do need to be careful telling me where that first n is. And it's going to be this bn sine n pi x over l cinch n pi over l times h minus y. Right? Are you okay with that? So that's using the Generalized superposition, we're saying, okay, let's 
hand wave right now, but let's allow us to go to infinity. Again, there's some, there's some conditions we have to do before we can go to infinity, but let's assume that, that, that those are going to be held. That's the next chapter coming up. So looking at those boundary conditions, I have satisfied how many of them so far? All but one, right? I've satisfied these two gave us the sine function. This one gave me the cinch function. So the only one remaining is when y equals zero, right? So let's put y equals zero in here. So let's let look at u of x and zero. First of all, it's this f1 of x. And that's going to be equal to the sum n equals 1 to infinity of this bn sine n pi x over l. And when I put y equals 0 here, we're going to be left with cinch of n pi h over l. That's putting in the y equals 0, right? So, as we said, the only unknown there is the Bn's, right? And how am I going to find those B sub n's? We're going to use the orthogonality principles on it. Which functions are orthogonal? The sine functions that we got from the Dirichlet problem. Okay? So what we would do is we would multiply, we would integrate, where are we integrating from? We've got to be careful now because we've got a rectangle. Which, which direction are we integrating? Zero to L. All right. And we'll multiply by some sine of m pi x over L. So we have the integral from 0 to L of sine of m pi x over L, f1 of x dx is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to L of the um, of sine m pi x over L, the sum n equals 1 to infinity of b sub n sine of n pi x over l cinch of n pi h over l. All right. Now, now we want to take advantage. So now we're making assumptions that this f has the right conditions. The conditions are going to be, this is going to have to be a piecewise continuous function. Provided it's a nice piecewise continuous function, then we can interchange this integral with this sum. All right. And if we interchange that, we're looking at um, the sum n equals 1 to infinity of uh, b sub n sine m pi x over l sine uh, n pi x over l cinch of n pi h over l. That's just a constant which varies in n. So they can, this piece can just be absorbed into the BNs. Everybody okay with that part? Just did this change, and as I said, whoops, I missed that integral. The integral from zero to L dx. I should have the dx down here. Okay, so I interchange those two limits. Okay. Down. 
whole point of this was to use the orthogonality. So the left hand side doesn't change. The left hand side is still going to be the integration of the uh, arbitrary function there, which has nice enough properties to it. So we're still going to have on the left hand side the integral from 0 to L f1 of x sine n pi, oh, whoops, I'm putting m there, m pi x over L dx. Okay, so keep that piece. Now, what can we say about this? In particular, about these. Okay, so if m equals n, we get L over 2, otherwise it's 0. So this infinite sum just reduces to only m, right? Let's go ahead and put that one extra step in there before we get the L over 2. We're going to get b sub m. Let me put in there with that constant, it's going to be the cinch of m pi uh, h over L. So this is going to become our Fourier constant there. And then we're going to have uh, the integral from 0 to L of sine squared m pi x over L dx, right? All the rest of them give us zeros. Only that one is not a zero. And so then we can see, <clears throat> we can see that our Fourier coefficient, so again, as was pointed out, this quantity becomes an L over 2, right? And so let's just see what is B sub M going to be equal to. Well, it's going to be equal to 2 over L cinch of M pi H over L. That, uh, the integral from 0 to L, f1 of x, sine m pi x over L, dx. So that's, this gives us our Fourier coefficient. how that orthogonality comes into play, how we need to do it. All right, so that, that basically completes the first problem. One sum. <laughs> yeah, four more. Yeah, I'm not going to bother too much with the whole All the rest of these notes, of course, are just going through all of the stuff I said before. Again, the first thing you want to focus on is we've got to find the Stern-Louisville problem. That's the second order differential equation that gives rise to the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions associated with homogeneous boundary conditions. That's where we saw we have the zeros on the vertical. So to get the functions of y, we're going to have to have zeros on the top and bottom of this rectangle. Okay, so we did all of these, put them together. And again, it's always useful to do things which will make your calculations easier by shifting to the other homogeneous boundary condition, which was at H, and center it about there. So when we're down, so when we're down at the zero one, going along the zero here, then of course you're going to just use Y instead of H. Because those are just other linear combinations. You had your 
you have mm -hmm. your two linearly independent solutions are e and e to the minus x, right? Yeah. But I need to do cosh and cinch. That's a different linear combination. How many in independent solutions? You can only get two, right? E and e to the minus x. So you can't use e to the x and cinch and cosh. You can use cinch, cosh. You can use cinch, e to the x. You can use cosh, e to the x. Because you take the right linear combination and shifting them, I, I haven't memorized my hyperbolic trig identities, but it's not that hard because you just do the exponentials and you do the shifts on it. This shift here is just shifting the arguments. So that's now basically an e to the alpha h minus y and a, uh, e and then you do the linear combination. So, but that's all it is. As long as you are doing separate ones, and you have to know that when you do cosh of h minus y is different than cinch of x minus y. But that is, should be pretty obvious those are different ones. Yeah. As long as they're different, they're going to be linearly independent, right? And that's what we need. And so we just choose appropriate linearly independent solutions. I don't think that was emphasized enough in the ODE course because you generally just used exponentials. You didn't, you, you didn't go to, oh, we couldn't use cautious decisions. But here, you can see this is messy enough as it was if you didn't do some smart thinking of which ones we can do to do the translations of it, your algebra is going to get a lot worse. That's <laughs> Bob. What did you do on this one? <laughs> Does choosing them just come from experience? A lot of it comes from experience, but it's not even experience. It's just sort of thinking about. You're thinking about where are the homogeneous boundaries, and you center it. About center it about where it's homogeneous. Does that help make a little more sense there? Yeah. And again, that, and it's also taking advantage, again, one of the things I've said is one of the problems with the exponentials is what? They're neither even nor odd functions, are they? But cinch and cosh are even and odd functions. And I think all of us geometrically understand even and odd functions better than we do just arbitrary functions. And then you can see if a homogeneous boundary is shifted up, then wouldn't you want to make the even and oddness about that shift? It just makes sense that way. Because in particular, what about an odd function at 0 if it's continuous? What's true about f of x is odd. What is f of 0? It has to be zero. Because what number is equal to its negative? Only zero. That's what odd means, right? And then you can see we're often looking with Neumann conditions, derivatives, derivatives of cinch go cosh, of cosh go to cinch, the even goes to the odd. Well, derivative of any odd function goes to the even function. So it is trying to take advantage. So you are, you're right that um, you, you need to just sort of get experience with it, but you've already had a lot of experience with functions. You've been beating functions on you for years now. And so by now, hopefully, you're getting a good feeling for what even and odd functions you like. And the more you take advantage of the geometry of these things, the easier your calculations become. One of the things about math is you're always trying to reduce it to a simpler problem if possible to make it easier on your side. Okay. All right. Okay, so the process could be repeated for other ones. So for example, if I look at the if I look at the U2 being with the G of Y 
at zero. All right. Now in this case, what are we going to do? So then we're going to have the homogeneous ones are going to be the top and the bottom. And so those are going to be cinch, and now that height is h, so it's going to be the cinch of n pi y over h. And then the, the uh, homogeneous one for this particular one is uh, the x being at l, if I'm looking at uh, g1 being non-zero here, so we're going to center it about l. Okay, you can do the same things on the other ones and so forth. <clears throat> but you, you have to keep track of which variable are you working with and so forth to know which functions. Okay. And so that general thing is just to add them all together. Okay. Next thing we want to do, we don't want to just, just be stuck in rectangular coordinates. It's an awful lot of important problems have circular dimensions on it. And one of the problems I think is on your take home, on one of your take homes is where you take a nice can of beer and put it into an ice bath. That's a nice cylindrical object and you're going to find the temperature distribution. You have to do two things. You have to find the time varying heat equation on that. Actually, that would be young double 40 series, all sorts of fun things. And you're going to have, and the 40 series is going to involve decimal functions. So, <laughs> so we're going to have to, we have to work with all sorts of other stuff. We need other coordinates. Okay? And many of you are interested in, in working with stuff like industry. And one of the best, best places for applied mathematicians would be uh, employed with different uh, aircraft design systems. Aircraft, you have a nice circular ones to start with. And so you need to understand about things. And when you're looking at aircraft, it's a fluid flow. Fluid flow relates to uh, weight equations and fluid dynamics, which they're actually nonlinear partial differential equations, but you better first know how to do linear ones. Okay, so we want to look at a circular region. All right, there it is. And um, this is basically the problem uh, two. Yes. Sorry, are we talking about low speed or high speed? Hmm? Are we talking about low speed or high speed? High speed what? Like low speed fluid dynamics? Because you talk about tube shape. Like how would you apply this to something high speed? Because there are yeah, like shocks and, and heat changes. Anytime you've got a wave equation, you can even simple ones, you can have shocks. Right. Which is just even basic traffic flow. Right. Traffic flow as you well run into a, on the freeway is rise to shocks. Um, but for aircraft, the point is different 